So hey, this is uh, Sean Carey at the Spencer Science Center, and we're going to kick off the last in our SoCal JWST talks uh, with a bang. So I'm going to introduce George Reed, who says, I think you all know him, he's the Regents Professor of Astronomy at the University of Arizona, Deputy Director of the Stewart Observatory. Formerly, he was the PI of the MITS instrument on Spitzer. Um, he's an expert in photometric calibration, and he's decided to double down on his grandness by being the science team lead of the Mid-Infrared Instrument, MIRI, for the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, so, uh, George, take it away. Okay. Well, it's great to have a chance to talk to you about MIRI. I will say I <clears throat> applied for and was picked to be involved with MIRI before we got Spitzer launched. And I think most of the people I knew at IPEC uh, decided I was insane. Uh, but it's worked out, so uh, here we go. So I'll talk about three things. One is a little background about infrared astronomy. I think this is, in some sense, a review for many of you, uh, but it's kind of neat. And then something about MIRI, really level, and then a couple science ideas just to get the brush turning on what you might want to do. I want about uh, performance at 10 microns. That's the sort of deep thermal infrared, and that's where JWST will have the most dramatic gains over what we're able to do up till now. But way, way back. Uh, the next slide is an analogy I like to use that doing 10 micron photometry from the ground is like trying to detect a match in a blast furnace. Can you match? Uh, I, I put it in there. There is a match, I guarantee. But that's because of the not only the huge thermal background, but the high level of variation in thermal background from the atmosphere. So I did a calculation about five years ago for another talk, which stunned me. We look at the performance that we were, Frank Lowe and I were able to squeeze out of our 61 inch telescope with very crude barometer systems. And I update that to what it would have been if I could cart the same material to a, a, one of the 8 meter background telescopes. It turned out at 10 microns, I would do exactly as well. I, I wouldn't have an array, I would only have a single detector. But every point source that you could get a signal to noise of eight on in two hours with the eight meter telescope, I could signal the noise of eight on with the system that we did on the telescope in, I think it was 1977. The story at two microns, this graph shows tremendous improvements until 1995 or so. But when I had this graph, it was just stunning. Uh, we got background limit in 1977, and lo and behold, it's a limit. And this tells you a lot about sort of history of deep thermal infrared astronomy. Um, the big books have, of course, helped. This explains why our biggest struggle in the infrared with big telescopes is to keep people from decommissioning all the instruments because there's just not the scientific advanced breakthrough that goes with big improvements in sensitivity. So the solution is to get a cold telescope launched in space where the background is about 10 million times lower. Uh, this, as you can see, Frank Lowe's original sketch, uh, which spit grew. This was Tim Harden had promoted radiative cooling before this. I think Frank came up with the idea independently and had the further insight that you could, the cooling requirements to get from 40 degrees to 6 degrees were slow because the heat capacity vanished, that you could use a modest helium cryostat and still achieve a long lifetime. Frank always would want to make everything perfect, so to avoid, to, to provide the minimum departure from spherical symmetry for the cryostat, was being the best shape for a cryostat, he shrank the instruments down to where they would each have fit in your pocket. Um, 
and then we got arguments about whether you can actually build a decent infrared instrument that you could fit in your pocket. But that's three. But next slide, the match is a lot easier to see. And Spitzer challenged that uh, this is one of a number of clone slides we developed. We used this breakthrough of using radio cooling of the telescope in space rather than putting it in a big vacuum tight crosstat to shrink everything except for the telescope and shrinking the budget. And anyway, I learned that this was one of the actual keys to getting Spit started. The way was I was going to visit my sister in New York. I got out of the train and got in line for a very long line for a cab. And there was a guy with a well, accent, kind of obnoxious voice. I mean, I turned around, looked down on the ground, and he had a pair of imitation alligator hide boots on. I looked up, and it was Dan Golden. And so I interviewed him about what it was that made him approve going ahead with Spitzer and how it was the warm launch concept. So having a new idea rather than pushing the same thing month after month, year after year, caught the attention of NASA upper management. And this was actually a critical graph, if maybe it was a little overstating, it was critical. But the idea of shrinking the telescope with a new idea and shrinking the budget was really critical for, for our having Spitzer at all. OK, so the slide is a graph of a performance metric that appeared in the Bacall Decadal Survey. It's basically how fast you can survey a given number of pixels worth on the sky. And so this is proportional to the number of pixels and divide the square of the sensitivity limit of those pixels it's, uh, it, to integrate to, if you have something that's half as sensitive, you have to integrate four times longer to get to the same depth. That's why it's divided by the square of the sensitivity limit. Number of souls is obvious. And so it starts out with the very first Twitters I was involved in, other people had very similar sensitivity um, on the ground. Then ISO, Iron ISO, and then Spitzer. And it is pretty incredible. Uh, it's a nine and a half month doubling time. And so the computer jocks are very proud of their more improvement of a two year doubling time. You this graph around your wall, and you can thumb your nose at them when they bring that up, because look at what we've done in the infrared. But that's always been with small telescopes. And the next plot is the diameter of the telescope. And we could have made Spitzer bigger. That's the point first after the year 2000. But as I explained, for political reasons, we didn't. Uh, that was followed by Akari and then by Wise, and then pretty much off the charts with JWST. So that's a really important aspect. Why is that important? It's because with telescopes, we were actually glim as much by resolution as by sensitivity. And in fact, I would say almost more with Spitzer, 24 microns. You could read the confusion limit in a few hours of integration, and so uh, it, a small beam was really critical. So JWST, take a look at JWST in this picture. The change solution is like in this next picture. It's really incredible. And if I put in paper on Mary that it was like going from a 300 kilopixel camera to a 16 megapixel camera in terms of the real resolution. And I use these analogies because you usually talk about resolution in the diameter of the beam, but it's really this is the area of the beam, uh, the, the real resolution you can achieve. And the nine month double time is going to be preserved 
all the JWST. Note, the level is logarithmic, and so this is why infrared astronomy has been so incredible for lifetimes. We, we got a wave, and we've been riding the wave, and with JWST, we, we will continue to ride the wave, uh, continue to make hopefully really great discoveries. So it's not easy, and I was giving a tour to the JWST management team of our 90-inch telescope, and I happen to know the weight of the tube of the telescope because I've been involved in re reworking, fixing things, repairing the telescope. It turns out the tube of our 90-inch telescope is three times as heavy as JWST in its entirety. So this is part of why, this is just a summary slide of why it is so difficult for something like JWST into space and this issue of very high technology and low mass sort of permeates the whole project. But, sorry, Jane and Mary together will provide, well, we all know about the gradient and sensitivity. Just remember it's more than three times as sensitive as Spitzer for sources. These are thousand times more sensitive than the ground. But on top of that, so there should be an and here, it gives arc second resolution, something we have never had at this sensitivity level, never even approached. There's very interference. The stability of operation in space, which has been exploited tremendously with Spitzer and HST on planetary transits, and hopefully that will keep with JWT because of the big advantages of operating that of sensitivity measure space, and MIRI has, it's a very versatile instrument, uh, and that's sort of a story behind that, that you, you could wire, there are three instruments from one to five microns, and so just one from to 28, and we're lucky that there's one um, mirror sort of, well, fine. I guess I can summarize it by saying that MIRI was the automatic descope option. So whenever a funding problem be looming over the horizon, which was all the time, except when they were already over the horizon, uh, MIRI to be put first on the list of descopes to deal with the problem. And so it's just sort of barely snuck into the mission. So we had to bundle into one instrument all the different measurement capabilities that three instruments were sharing at the shorter wavelength. So it has imaging, has low resolution spectroscopy with a resolution of about 100. That can be operated in a slitless mode to look at planetary transits without worrying about slit losses. There's a moderate resolution spectroscopy module, resolution of about 2,000. It includes an integral field unit and some very sophisticated coronagraphs. So Polar somehow got left out, but almost everything in there in terms of measurement capabilities is included in MIRI. And I really was at the bottom here. If you can't produce revolutionary science, it is your fault or our fault with all those capabilities. So um, I can pause here if there are any questions or comments. If we just push ahead, but your chance. Feel free to unmute yourself and uh, go ahead and ask. Saying everybody is muted, so if you would like to go ahead and ask a question, they should unmute themselves and ask for questions. Oh. So this topic is Mary itself. Um, it's an interesting management story because MIRI was designed and built by a committee. Uh, six research organizations, two space agencies, 11 countries, Goddard, JPL, Space Telescope, Northrop Grumman, East Astrium, and Raytheon. Um, you can imagine a more complicated management chart. Jill Wright and I were the nominal leaders. Um, Alistair Glass and Mike Ressler did most of the work. Uh, well, that isn't true either. 
Uh, there are many, many people that did most of the work. And remarkable is that this all came together very, very smoothly and kind of confounded the management experts that said there is no way this is going to fit as a team. And I hate to say it, but I think part issue, here's an actual picture of the instrument, is we were so threatened as being the automatic descope option that we just learned that we had to work together, and so we never forgot. And the instrument got delivered in great shape, and well ahead of the other instruments. Um, and as you'll see, it's a, it, it actually delivers on all the different performance metrics that were designed into it. It's an example. Um, this is the imager module. It gives you an idea for the, the, the scale. A complicated filter wheel in there. I think there's a way to understand it because normally as an enter it's fairly simple. This view and it's divided there's a fairly by standards of Spitzer for sure, there's a fairly small field devoted to imaging seventy four by one hundred thirteen arc seconds. Then the same field of view is the low resolution spectrometer and four different coronagraph modules. The levels are 0.11 arc seconds, and that means that the images are not sampled from second shortest photometric band at 7.7 .7 microns out to obvious longest band, slightly less than Nyquist sampled at the shortest band, which is 5.6 microns. The low spectroscopy is highlighted here. On the target acquisition region in the imager, then an offset, the slit is indicated, and then the spectrum is dispersed from 5 to 14 microns. And because this is a grism that's put in the beam with the filter wheel, uh, everything is dispersed within the field. It's a hard to think of a scientific advantage for using slitless spectroscopy in general because the thermal background rises steeply from 5 to really the end of the sensitivity of this instrument is 12, not 14 microns, but nonetheless the point is the same. So you get this high background across your whole spectrum, and so the sensitivity at 5 microns is really hurt by the background at 12. However, one application where it is important is planetary transits where you can put the star in the the slitless dispersed spectrum, which we've put over at one edge, so we read out as fast as possible, and then you don't have slit loss to worry about and guiding jitter, and so we've included a slitless capability for planetary transits to get a spectrum and to extend the dynamic range. And um the lower left, is spectral properties and you can see why I wouldn't encourage you to use it at 14 microns. The trans has gone to something like, I don't know, 11% of the peak. Um, and there's also, a, a dis it's not a leak, it's a dispersion rollover around 4 microns, which you can see poking up there. That an issue for the slitless operation, but that's blocked when you have the slit, and so you can see sensitivity with the slit goes basically 5 to 12 microns. And the spectral resolution in, at 7.5 microns is close to 100. You can see the upper right that it basically changes linearly with, with wavelength. In terms of the non planetary transit use, uh, so our idea is this would be used exclusively for sort of very faint objects. So the, the operations and use of this is really optimized around the faintest possible objects. So there are four different coronagraphs, each of them optimized for a different filter band, and all over to one side of the imager. 0.65 and 11.4 microns are to isolate pneumonia absorption in exoplanetary atmospheres. 15.5 microns is sort of the, the 
the P blank for exoplanets, uh, fairly massive ones, and then 23 microns was designed specifically for debris disks. The 3 microns is a standard Leo coronagraph with an occulting spot. The other coronagraphs are, well, let's look at the next slide, four quadrant phase masks. And basically, if you look at the lower left, they are a piece of uranium that's been etched so that you have a little change in thickness in the opposing quadrants. So one set of opposing quadrants delay the phase of the light by pi compared with the other set of opposing quadrants. And if you put a diffraction limited image right on the center of that mask, then the phase delay in the image will cause it to cancel. In all respects, this is very similar to a standard Leo coronagraph. So you have a telescope that makes an image. You put the mask in the image plane. So pattern, uh, you put the peak of the area pattern right on the cross of, of the mask. The mask introduces the phase delays, but it also introduces some diffraction. So you put a pupil, <clears throat> diffraction appears at the edge of the pupil, so you can put a stop in that's undersized at the, the next pupil in the optical train. Get rid of that extra diffracted light, and so deliver to the focal plane a new image where you've canceled out the starlight from or any central point source. The edge of this is a design is that with a coronagraph you typically have a central spot that's two or three lambda over d in radius. And type of coronagraph, there is no central occulting radius, so you can get much closer in the inner working angle is smaller. The direction at larger angles is very similar to that with a standard Leo coronagraph. The touch with this design is the pi retardation is not achromatic, so you have to operate this kind of coronagraph in a narrow spectral band, and that's why we have three of them, so we get three different spectral bands. The next module in the most vicious, actually, is the medium resolution spectrometer. And so the, the light for it starts with an integral field unit. And there are actually a set of them which are nested so that if you put your source in the smallest, shortest wavelength integral field unit, it is also the, the is divided by Dacroix. So you will get that spectra in all four of these integral field units into four different spectra channels. There's an image slicer to make integral field unit work. Uh, there's a picture of it in the lower left, and only of how it works. Um, in the upper left, the image slicer mirror divides the spectra up into individual subspectra, which are then each of them individually masked, and then into a very complex spectrometer goes into four different arms, decided into four different wavelength range ranges, and then in pairs those wavelength ranges are brought to a single uh, a detector. So there are two detectors, each of which co covers two of those wavelength ranges, and the the resolution ranges from basically 3,500 to 1,500 as you go from the shortest wavelengths to the longest ones. You can, there are three different gradings for each of these arms. And so you can put in the gradings sequentially on a grading wheel, and you take three exposures with three gradings, and you have a complete spectrum at a nominal resolution of about 2,000 from 5 to 28.5 microns. So this is a very efficient, very sophisticated spectrometer. I'd say a complete spectrum, you'll have a complete data cube that includes the the spill information, the, the imaging information, as well as the spectral information. And here is just a, a graph that shows the resolving power from each of those subsets uh, versus wavelength. And you see it starts, the peak is around 3,500. And in the longest wavelength, it's down to about 1,500. 
Oh, a critical part of this instrument is the cryo cooler. Um, it's complicated because it, it basically is spread over every part of JWST. So there's electronics and compressors in the spacecraft. There's a cooling line, which is, its proper name is Slinky, but to the engineers, it's the Refrigerator Line Deployable Assembly, RLDA, which branches across from the spacecraft. And you can see it's sort of in the center of this picture. It's kind of a spiral line uh, to the, the instrument. And then the heat exchanger stage on the instrument with a Joule Thompson expansion valve, which is basically the output. The heat sink is about 6 Kelvin and the cool instrument to about six and a half Kelvin, and the detectors to about that same temperature. This is very challenging just from the cooler technology point of view, but also all of the different area the interfaces, the, the, the city to keep the energy from getting into the, the slink or other places. And it's become rather infamous, but about Oh, really a year ago, uh, things more or less righted themselves. The cooler was delivered uh, last summer, and things have been going quite smoothly since then. The flight cooler passed its delivery review at the end of May, and it seemed to be, well, never in this kind of project, say you're on the home stretch, but it seems like things are going very well. And this, of course, has the huge advantage that it means that Mary should be available for the entire duration of the JWST mission. Just to show you how the cooler works, you know, it's not that exotic. It's the engineering details. So here's how your refrigerator works. There's a compressor. Coolant's on the back where the compressed gas is cooled off. Then there's an expansion valve. And um, cooling coil probably on your freezer compartment. And then the gas run around and compressed again. Here's the same deal. There's a compressor. You take a compressed working fluid, which is helium. Uh, you cool it. You use pulse tube coolers, which are a sort of resonant cooler with a chamber that you the gas goes into. loses It, it loses some of its heat, and then it expands as it comes out of that chamber and cools, and that gives you 18 Kelvin gas. Use that to cool a shield around the instrument. Then there's an expansion valve. Otherwise, it was a Joule Thompson valve. Uh, that gives six Kelvin gas. That cools the instrument, and the gas goes around to the compressor again. So it's actually a very familiar concept. It's just very complicated from an engineering point of view. Okay, that's the instrument. Um, if there's any question, I can answer it. Otherwise, I will just push on as suggested before. I'm going to give you uh, some hot points of Mary science. We'll try to on a whole bunch of things here, but very quickly. So, High Redshift Universe. I found this lovely ad for First Light. You can get it as a DVD. Uh, and the review from the Telegraph says something both beautiful and intensely dramatic. So, that's what we're looking for. Mary's important role to play <clears throat> because galaxies at the redshift we expect to find, the, the first ones are basically out of reach for detecting emission lines. And this is because all the bright emission lines of, are at lengths than 3,700 angstroms, the, the brightest emission line in the the near E is lambda 3727 of oxygen. The, emission li the next bright emission line, believe it or not, is Lyman alpha. And it's found beyond a redshift of about 7 that Lyman alpha is frequently just missing, probably absorption from intervening gas. And as the metallicity goes lower, as you see in the upper right, the red spectrum is a metallicity of 5% of solar compared with blue, which is solar. Um, 
the line lines get relatively stronger and all the other lines get relatively weaker, it's likely that for a, a galaxy at a redshift beyond half or so, the only line that JWST will be able to detect is hydrogen alpha with mirror, at least the most detectable line. And this galaxy that got a lot of publicity uh, earlier this year about probably being at redshift 11.1, um, numbers work out that in 10 to 20 hours, mirror should be able to detect H alpha in this, in this galaxy, which would be sort of the final confirmation that it really redshift to 11.1. So I took a look. Um, I found that the video infrared instruments are being decommissioned, except on VLT, where Vizier has recently been upgraded with a new and high performance detector array. Um, the mirror spectrometer is about 700 times more sensitive than that instrument is, so you know this is obviously totally out of reach. In, any other method of trying to make this detection. And again, all because of the high background from the ground. Okay, I'll show you a couple of things that could be done for AGN evolution. So I'll know about this plot, the Megorian relation, the proportionality between stellar mass in galaxies and black hole mass. In this case, the stellar mass is given by the velocity dispersion. And so we'd really like to know how this got established. And maybe the most telling way to investigate that is to look at the very high redshift Z of six quasars, um, where it's already a huge challenge to figure out how to make a black hole that's massive enough because the black holes in these objects are 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 9 solar masses, typically. And if you're going to Obey Megorian relation, if you have 10 to the 9 solar mass black hole, you have to have a few times 10 to the 11 solar masses of star, star formed around it. Really challenging for picture of galaxy formation. But if you have that mass of stars, they have to be young, because the universe isn't old enough. Any other solution, that means that their luminosity per unit mass must be much higher than we're used to. And so if they actually follow the Megorian relation, you can fairly simply demonstrate that they could account for as much as 20% of the flux from one of these high redshift quasars at 2 microns, observed frame 2 microns. And the Balmer break, visible from those stars, and the Balmer break is quite robust over the age range of stars that could possibly have formed in these galaxies. So it's a minded observation to test whether the Megorian relation is in place at a redshift of six. Is just JWST, this is not really a MIRI measurement, but use it to just brute force uh, take a spectrum. In the case where the Bauer break is prominent, you actually should be able to measure the next most prominent spectral feature in these galaxies and the stars, and that's the CO band at 2.3 microns, and you could actually get a handle on the stellar populations, young stellar populations in very many galaxies should they have formed around these redshift quasars. It, in the near infrared, MOS fire has enough spectral resolution, but about 50 times poorer sensitivity than near spec, so this, is, this whole investigation is definitely a JWST-only kind of investigation. Here are MIRI oriented thing that can be done. Um, you all know about the the fine structure lines. I've indicated the ones here, the mid infrared fine structure lines that are indicates indications of high excitation from an AGN. Five um, explicitly used with Spitzer. Oxygen four used a lot with Spitzer, but a little potentially contaminated by star formation. And then because it was not accessible with SPIT except with the low resolution IRS module, NEON 6 at 7.65 microns, but NEON 6 is a beautiful line. It has ionization potential of 158 electron volts, a 
for a fermion of very high critical density, it and neon 2 are just about the record holders. Um, it's in a region of very low interstellar extinction. Its ratio of strength to hydrogen recombination lines is fully independent of the ionization parameter. It's a beta probe for AGNs. I've worked out a recent paper on um, uh, start to look for uh, a very obscure AGNs and ULERGs. I worked out the relative sensitivity. Um, it turned with first with JWST on R220, you could detect with this line uh, an AGN with a luminosity of 10 to the 7 solar luminosities, which is vanishingly faint relative to the stellar luminosity of this ULERG. Uh, it would be a pretty unique character, and comparing with New Star, this reading paper by Tang et al., uh, GST would be two orders of magnitude more sensitive for the same integration time than New Star at looking for an obscured AN. Now, I think that, that number for a version of this talk that I gave at Harvard CFA, I'm a little nervous about bragging too much about being better than the experts, actually more than two orders of magnitude, but let it out or they'll put a contract out on me. Okay. Close home. Um, Mirror's incredible capability for looking, for taking spectra in uh, star forming gold cloud cores. And here there is a uh, very nasty joke that Mother Nature has played on us. If you look at the spectrum, gray spectrum is the atmospheric transmission under pretty good conditions. And you'll notice that, of course, there's a 10 micron window and the 20 micron pseudo window. The absorption double point at the top. Nicely centered on the 10 micron atmospheric window, isn't it? Over at 18 microns, an silicate absorption, which is nicely centered on the cleanest part of the 20 micron atmospheric window. And so we have, in, in a core where stars might be forming, we have this nasty anti coincidence that the interstellar windows are sort of from 5 to 8 microns, and from, let's say, 12 to 17 microns, and they are nicely blocked by the Earth's atmosphere. So being above the atmosphere is actually really important for Mary, as well as the sensitivity, the angular resolution, and all the other wonderful technical aspects of the instrument. And to show that's important, this spectrum that Klaus Pantopadon computed, the upper spectrum at high resolution, based on a Spitzer or S observation in the high res module, which is the lowest spectrum of this sort, and the the model of the Spitzer data is the intermediate one, you can see the incredible benefit from the higher resolution of MIRI in terms of most of the, the emission lines here are water, but of course there are hydrocarbons and other interesting lines mixed in there. And so it will be a tremendous breakthrough in terms of able to do chemistry, identify trace elements, look for biologically important elements like water and hydrocarbons. It's the sensitivity and the, and the spectral resolution, but because JWST is above the atmosphere. we have to mention exoplanets. So um, I'm going to show you an example from a secondary eclipse simulation. Um, this was from a, a paper by Demi et al. And the idea was if you look at the lower right during an eclipse, you, you sense the planet emission and mirrors two filters, which you can put one of them on the carbon dioxide absorption and another one on pseudo-continuum, sort of in the 10 micron window on a super exoplanet. And if you had a major effort, meaning you look at a number of transits 
you should get enough signals to noise to tell whether this exoplanet had a carbon dioxide rich atmosphere. Now, from an economical point of view, the, the hydrogen of the carbon dioxide will tell you whether the atmosphere is hydrogen poor, where you could have strong hydrogen, strong carbon dioxide, or hydrogen rich, where it would be much weaker. I gave a talk to John McCain, and I I was feeling a little brash at the time. I told him we would use this to monitor global warming on exoplanets, which in full you could do, but maybe not a very serious suggestion. Oh, that's a run-through of the capabilities, but what I have found in thinking about what to do with MIRI and the little bit of GTO time I have is the capabilities of JWST and MIRI are sufficiently beyond what I'm using. thinking about. It's actually not been that easy to come up with science programs that really make full use of that. And so I urge you to start thinking really hard and out of the box about things you can do, because these capabilities all taken together add up to just an immense breakthrough in what you do. And I'm, I keep to persuade people to be careful not to think of doing of the next obvious project along the line that they've already been pursuing. Obviously, you can do almost anything you've been thinking of doing a bit better than before, but try to think of something that's really new and really breakthrough with what Mary and AWST can do. Included here are a couple of websites. The first one is one I maintain, which I think at present is the most thorough one on Mary. And then there's one at Space Scope Science Institute that is coming up speed and probably will eclipse mine pretty soon. Um, there should be an exposure time calculator released in the next few months. And between the websites and that, and I should add, uh, we wrote 10 papers on the instrument, which are all available from my website. Um, they're all from PASP and through ADS. The getting from my website is when we made an error in the paper, it gets posted first on my website, so you'll be updated on all the most correct information. And there's one notice there about the sensitivity of the LRS at this point. So dig into the websites um, and think really out of the box and come up with something great to do with Mary. And now it's question time. George, that was really exciting. Uh, a lot of people digesting your talk as well as their lunch, George. So. Uh, this is, I do have a comment. Um, the, uh, the URL that George has got for the SCI instrument pages, um, those have migrated over to um, a new T dedicated website. So. Can uh, make sure everybody's happy with the, the, that U URL. Hmm. I have a question. Before, uh, I guess you, is, there, is there a way to look at the relative sensitivity of the slit mode versus the IFU mode? I mean, in terms of the difference, you highlighted the difference in the wavelength. Trying to say, you know, if you're looking at a faint object, how uh, to find the which would rather uh, which the biggest bang for the buck? Okay, um, so this a little bit confused by the fact that we were underestimating the LRS sensitivity by a factor of three, but I think it's still the case that if you're looking for emission lines, the, the resolution spectrometer wins. And there are detailed sensitivity curves, and, and polynomial fits to those curves in, in paper nine of our PASP series. Uh, so uh, you use those, and the polynomial fits were put in there specifically to deal with questions like yours. I see Dean said the link didn't work, but I tried it, and it worked. Now I don't know how to get back. <laughs> Specific. The link will work, but all this information is being migrated over, so it will go away. 
So to it now, it's going to go away soon as when we launch a new website, which is All great. right. So I should issue, um, I'll have links on my web page. So you need to go to my web page first. And Dean needs to tell me when I need to uh, switch, and we'll then switch. Hey, Sean, I have a question. So, so you're already deep into the design when the exoplanet science field kind of just takes off. Can you, like, comment a little bit on, you know, what, how that process evolved for you guys as you're trying to figure out how to best accommodate that science as you're you know, you've already got Miri designed, and you're, you're, you've got pieces of built already, right? And then you, you want to figure out how to add to the exoplanet science case. Um, how do you Well, the ISPA design was pretty much frozen, and the only feature that we really could add was the slitless grism mode. We had, did have the capability to do subarrays, so you don't have to disperse the signal from the star. And I think, other than adding a slitless grism, um, we mostly are just paying attention to some of the the exoplanet needs. That said, um, we have to march to a large extent to the instrument requirements, and those are all formulated in the exoplanet era. And so it's coming around to a more detailed laboratory tests that will hopefully illustrate better what needs to be done to get the best exoplanet data. Okay. This, this is kind of from IPEC. Uh, I, I, could you comment on uh, the dynamic range of the imager in particular? As uh, sensitivity increases, usually what suffers is dynamic range, uh, as we have seen in successive, successive instrumentation. So how is it with this one? Uh, where, where is the brightness in particular is the limit? And are, for instance, calibrators that we are still able to use? Okay. So, um, right. The Let's the dynamic range for the full imager field is um, basically overlaps with what you can get from ground-based telescopes, but not by a whole lot. So go from some you get decent signal to noise on a ground-based telescope, so something like ninth or tenth magnitude, fainter. You expand the dynamic range by using subarrays. And again, the details are given in these papers that we've posted. But uh, Miri, and I would say JWST in general, uh, is not a, a, a bright source capability. It's a faint source capability. Are there any questions for George? Okay, Sean, thanks. George, for joining in today and uh, sharing this wonderful talk about Mary. Um, we're certainly excited about Mary. Yeah, really appreciate it, George. Oh, well, thanks for listening in.